So here we are at Neptune Beach, Sunday, June 12, 2011. I've been here a couple of days now fasting and focusing on the future of my work and activism with Mind Freedom International and the movement that's led by psychiatric survivors, sometimes called the MAD movement. So, when I was in the movement about 10 years, I had taken a detour to other work like uh, the environmental movement and the peace movement and citizens' rights in terms of being consumers. In October 1985, I had just turned 30. I came out here to Neptune for three days of fasting and reflection about where I wanted to head. And I decided to return to the MAD movement. I felt that it was part of the movement, capital T, capital M, that we had something special to add in terms of our experience with the use of mutual support to help people get through extreme and overwhelming times. And also our creativity, that we are literally thinking outside the box, that we can have a creativity that is something that can add to other movements. And now here I am, 25 years later, 55. In a few months, I turned 56. During those times of uh, those years of uh, work, we created what became Mind Freedom International. And because of a lot of support from family and friends, uh, you know, my wife Deborah has been just so important during this whole quarter century in our creating our home together and sustaining ourselves. My long term friends, short term friends. Uh, my family, like my mom, who would say uh, when I was a kid, you can do anything you want as long as you enjoy it. And, well, that's been my goal these last 25 years, is going to work and fighting the good fight for activism and social change and protest. And uh, there's been a lot of that. There's been a lot of that, and I have enjoyed it. So, you know, I've been reflecting also about the future because so, so much has gone well, but what could be done even better in terms of a bigger organization with more members, more people in the movement, more professionalism in terms of building a nonprofit and leadership development, involving our members in taking leadership. But really I'm here because I think it's time to put into action discussions about nonviolent peaceful, direct action. What do I mean by that is like protest, what Gandhi called satyagraha, or truth force, peace force, sometimes civil disobedience, but it doesn't have to be. But it's non-violently putting ourselves in front of the problem, getting out from behind our computer screens, out from behind our TV screens, and working with others and putting ourselves in front of the problem. And certainly, in 2011 documenting it for those computer screens and TV screens because we are each our own media. But what is the role now of more nonviolent direct action? There's been occasional uses of it in our in our movement. I found over these years that Martin Luther King actually called for this. He called for a creative maladjustment. He said that he was proud to be psychologically maladjusted to oppression. In fact, he said the salvation of the world lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. Over and over, he said the world was in dire need of a new organization, the International Association for the Advancement of Creative Maladjustment, IAACM. Well, I like to think that this movement is part of that, inspired by the civil rights movement, and we've certainly been questioning what we consider generally in our society to be normal. I know that Gandhi would say that one should seek dialogue. I feel that we have with the World Psychiatric Association, American Psychiatric Association, 
Uh, here in Lane County, we have sought dialogue. Sometimes we've had it, but generally there's been a closed door to dialogue between representatives of organizations of those hurt by the psychiatric system and mental health professional organizations. I've even written an article about the moral imperative of dialogue. And we'll keep trying for dialogue, but I think we have tried it. And that's been a personal goal of mine these last few years. And in my own way, I'm trying to find a little bit of that purity, coming out here and fasting for a couple of days and reflecting. But I think what I'm realizing is that one can prepare as much as one can, and, and it, it's highly advisable. But really, taking action is one step toward this purity. I don't think we ever are totally pure. There's no way that I could reach the astounding uh, you know, purity that I've seen by some amazing spiritual leaders and activist leaders and Gandhi and King. But I, I think that right now what we're facing is that science has established, the numbers are crunched, that we're looking at a global environmental crisis. And this is now becoming more and more aware to the majority of the population that what is called normal is actually hurting our planetary system, our ecosystem, our life force on the planet. In fact, one of the signs of that mental and emotional distress is that there's a significant minority of people in denial, often representing great wealth, who are actually in denial of this ecological crisis. That's how extreme it is. So what's called normal is helping to produce that. And so I'm realizing that we're in a universality of distress, that to be human is to experience extreme mental and emotional distress, to live, to exist, to be. You're on that edge between chaos and order, facing mortality. And now we have evidence that what is called normal with these big brains of ours threatens the environmental system. And perhaps that is inherent in having this kind, of, this kind of amazing mind that the humans have. So we humans have a responsibility to have great, deep change. It cannot look normal, what is required. I'm not saying it will happen, or even is likely to happen, but it must happen, and the change that is necessary will not look normal. So we're all in this together. So to, to heal ourselves, the planet, each other, the systems that we're in, will require us all to take action. That is the step toward healing, recovery, purity, is to take action and to peacefully and nonviolently, in a strategic way, put ourselves in front of the oppression. In our movement, I believe that that means more nonviolent direct action perhaps using street theater and creativity, perhaps going into other issues and showing that what's called normal is harming the planet. It's in, in a way an adventure, but one that I hope that we take uh, thoughtfully. So I'm saying that we do have a free mind that that's the origin of healing, is an individual personal decision for healing and recovery. And that's what's needed now in a planetary way, that we can't wait for purity to take action. That as purified as we can, we need to go and take steps and take direct, nonviolent, peaceful action in front of the oppression. We need to do that in a peaceful way. We need to recognize that we're in pursuit of a beloved community, as Martin Luther King called it. Yes, to love our opponents, that we're all in a mental and emotional distress together. So we need a global intervention. Those of you who've been through recovery of any kind recognize the role now and again of an intervention. And we need to intervene with our society itself, nonviolently, compassionately, recognizing that we're both in distress, but that in an act of love, 
we need to nonviolently put ourselves in front of the distress to reach the humanity of the whole system in ourselves. So that's what I see as the future. I don't have the exact, the exact recipe, whether this means encampments or guerrilla theater or protest, but I can say that I look forward to engaging in this next step with you and being a participant with you as we reclaim what it is to be a human being and what is the human spirit and that we do that together in a mutually supportive way. I'm as imperfect as it comes so let me know when I need to improve and especially how to improve and then together let's let's show our society how to improve because it's it's an emergency. Thank you.